grazie molto a Cecilia, Raffaella e i colleghi per un convegno splendido e un grande privilegio essere qui a Roma. E mi scuso che parlo in inglese perché uh, so, uh, sarò più veloce in inglese. The year is 1608. Though he is as yet unaware, Rubens will shortly be summoned back to Antwerp and his Roman sojourn abruptly curtailed. He's working in Santa Maria in Vallicella, the grand new church of the Oratorian Fathers. Rubens has been given a second chance to satisfy his patrons in the production of a huge triptych for the main altar. He describes it to Chiepio as the finest and most splendid opportunity in all Rome. The church would come to be regarded as uno dei maggiore musei romani di arte contemporanea. The artist is painting on panels of specially high quality smooth slate, purchased in May 1608, brought by ship from Lavagna in Liguria and spliced together with metal ties before being fixed to the wall and overlaid with a thick layer of ground and a layer of priming, as was verified when the altarpiece underwent conservation in 2004. It is not my task to add to discussion by Butler and others as to why slate was chosen, nor will I here ponder why, counterintuitively, Rubens ignored slate's chromatic characteristics as exploited most famously by Sebastiano del Piombo. Rather, I want to make two simple points. Firstly, we may be sure that Rubens did not leave it to others to select the slate and ensure its surfaces were as he wished a process that would have necessitated a haptic relationship with this material. Secondly, this support obliged the artist to work in situ, and he thus spent his working hours in what a later contemporary described as un vaso bello. And although in 1608 work remained to be done on the interior, most of the other altarpieces were in place and most of the luxuriously designed and colored Pietre Mischi for the chapels were completed. Rubens did not scorn to concern himself with ornamento. In fact, the final paragraph of his letter to Chiepio as he mounted his horse concerned gli ornamenti di marmo around his paintings. Immediately to the left of where Rubens worked is the chapel dedicated to San Filippo Neri, begun in 1600 and incorporating in a design by Guerra and Longhi what we would now call semi-precious stones, such as alabaster, lapis lazuli, amethyst, agate, onyx, mother of pearl. Next to it, in the north aisle, is the Chesi family chapel, begun 1589 and completed 1603, with its predominance of yellow, red, and blue. Rubens' home city was a world center for gemstones. Moreover, the ability to identify precious stones was quite simply part of a gentleman's education. Minerals are part of Rubens' world and registered in his work, as I show in a forthcoming article. The bejeweled robes of Saints Gregory and Domitila are an early manifestation of what would become a familiar feature of Rubens' paintings of biblical and historical subjects. He must have known that these details would never be visible to the congregation in the nave. The paintings are at angles. 
But he gave them his full attention nonetheless, whether through personal affinity with precious stones or to demonstrate to himself and his patrons his virtuosity in being able to represent them. The diadem of St. Domitilla is surely a rehearsal for Juno's diadem painted shortly after his return to Antwerp, though it lacks the stupendous signature ruby that surmounts the latter's ornament and mirrors, as many have pointed out, the frontispiece Rubens de designed for Aguilonius's treatise in 1611. Such large rubies, a speciality of the Antwerp gem trade, would become on many occasions a way in which the artist whose name Petro Rubenio was synonymous with red stone acknowledged authorship of his work. The presence of richly colored marble is recalled in the so-called Four Philosophers, painted 1611 to 12, in which can be identified the giallo antico marble of the surround to the bust of Seneca, a dominant material also in the Chiesa Nuova, and a column so specific that it suggests it is at the very least based on first-hand knowledge of marbles such as Sicilian jasper. Although issues of portrait identity and location have been paramount in discussion of this work, it is worth pointing out that it is also an essay on texture and touch, fur, textile, feather, vellum. Furthermore, the variegated patterning of marble potentially indicates a world that may sink back into the void, reflected in the cataclysms of antiquity, which along with the meteorological effects which have interested scholars, lend a fragility and anxiety to this scene of philosophical discourse. That Rubens struggled to comprehend and articulate the relationship between marble and paint, as evidenced in the essay on the imitation of antique sculpture, suggests how complicated he found not only flesh, but also stone. Although the Chesi family distanced themselves from ongoing construction at the Vallicella site after the death of Cardinal Chesi in 1606, Rubens would have known Count Federico Chesi through his brother Philip and through his friend Johannes Faber, as Teresa has uh, just discussed. He would therefore have known about the activities of the Lince, founded in 1603 by Cesi Stelluti and Johannes Heckius, a doctor from the Low Countries, who was in Rome in 1606. Scholars have focused on Cesi's interest in fossilized wood, but in his Universal Theory of Nature, published only after his death in 1630, Chesi not only wrote about the generation of the said plants, I quote, and wood, and of the aquiline rocks, of which a large quantity is also generated in the said places, but also of all the other stones known up to now and of others too that are no longer observed or described by other authors since by long and diligent observation he discovered the common Pietra Aquilina is generated. As a painter, Rubens would have had a particular interest in minerals since it is from them that many of his pigments derived. As Leonhardt has pointed out, pharmakon in Greek can mean both remedy and poison, but it also means to paint, not a natural color, but an artificial tint. Moreover, in this period, stones enjoyed primacy over plants in the pharmacy, not only as magical amulets in which, as Teresa has established, Rubens was also interested but also in Materia Medica. 
The Chalcedonies that Rubens favored and later discussed with his friend Peresh could be carved into intaglios and cameos. Rubens' earliest known drawing of a cameo, Jaffe believed it to be a coin, but it had been established beyond doubt it is in fact a cameo, is signed and dated 1606 and must have been executed in Rome. Cameos depend entirely for their visual articulation on the carver's identification of the banded color inherent in agate, agata, and his intuitive response to the narrative potential. Suffice it here to mention not only what surely must have been the apogee of Rubens' passion for agates, his acquisition in 1619 of the Byzantine vase now in Baltimore, and the, con and the con account in the peel of his, the pleasure he took towards the end of his life in his agates and carnelians. While the exquisite craftsmanship of this object undoubtedly delighted the uh, artist, minerals were also abundantly available as raw material in the rough, puzzling three-dimensional objects that could be touched and handled without their mysterious depths. As here, collected by Conrad Gessner and others and drawn in 1565, plus a small collection of the artist Tacita Dean, the contemporary German artist who is very interested in agates. So minerals then uh, were available and uh, of interest in their raw state, not only as carved objects. Rubens' friend Peresh particularly sought to purchase precious stones that were in their matrix, since, as he states, in the hands of kings, stones were never in their natural state. Lucretius, whose stoic cosmology was surely known to Rubens, express the ambiguity of minerals. So when we lay our hands upon a stone, we touch the color, yet perceive alone by touching it the solid hard outside, but not the color which doth there abide. Italy in the late 16th century was the seedbed of the science of mineralogy. Hecius's travel notes contain detailed observation on uncut stones, now impossible to identify, and although nothing remains for sure of Chesi's mineral collection, there is no doubt that it existed as part of a museum to the existence of which Hecius testifies as early as 1605. A fragmentary inventory survives in which we find una pietra bianca e nera, and pezzetti vari di marmo politi e non politi. It is generally accepted that some mineral spe uh, specimens in the collection of Cassiano came from this source. Cassiano's minerals exemplify contemporary interest, not only in prophylactic stones, but also in pattern and color particularly with chalcedonies, a crypto-crystalline form of silicate, and above all with agates, sliced and polished to reveal their concentric rings. Time does not permit me to enumerate the collections containing minerals available to and discussed by Rubens' contacts, so I will briefly summarize the main points, starting with the Grand Duke Ferdinand de Medici, uncle of Rubens' Gonzaga patron, whom he met in Pisa in 1603, waiting to board ship for Spain. The collection remained in Pisa until Nicolas Steno took them back to Florence, where he established a distinguished mineral cabinet for Ferdinand II. The first, though much later, inventory records with dimensions not only legni in petri e fossili, but also, among many others, 
Cinque pezzi di calcedonio candido rosso e trasparente. None of these would have possessed the premium of the marvelous that characterized objects in the Kunstkammer. Seals and cameos were also included in these collections as they were found in the ground, and there remained uncertainty as to their origins. Minerals were an important component of the Museum of Francesco Calzolari, the Verona pharmacist who numbered among his patients the Gonzaga Duke of Mantua. The posthumous publication of his catalogue included many detailed plates of minerals. In Rome, Michele Mercati had collected rocks and fossils in his role as Prefetto del Giardino Botanico at the Vatican. Many of his specimens were marbles from Imperial Rome, which is thought he found in the excavation sites, suggesting an overlap between an interest in antiquity and an interest in marble as mineral. Mercati was first described as geologo in 1576, and he himself created and employed the term metalloteca. Metalli, meaning objects from under the earth, was also the word used by Bellori in his Life of Rubens when describing the treasures the artist had transported from Rome, intending to convey not only precious metals, but minerals such as the agates and onyxes mentioned in Rubens's will. Metalloteca was not published until long after Mercati's death, but the illustrations engraved between 1575 and 81 were available in his lifetime. In 1604, Cesi went to Naples, where he visited Della Porta and Imperato. Although the latter is more famous for his interest in plants and animals, he wrote to a fellow collector, Il mio teatro di natura non consiste in altro che in cose naturali come di minerali, animali e piante. Of particular relevance because of his extensive publications, as well as on account of his cataloging system, was Aldrovandi, he described his own natural history museum as un microcosmo that included not only plants and animals, but altre cose sotoranee come terre, succi concreti, magri e grassi, pietre, mami, sassi, metalli e altri misti. We have only a partial picture of what Rubens had in his library, but we do know he had five volumes of Aldrovandi's works bound by Plantin Moretus. Moreover, among the authors who wrote on minerals owned by Albert Rubens, and probably originating in his father's library, were Theophrastus, Pliny, Albertus Magnus, Gessner, and Cardinus. The latter's De Subtilate Rerum, 1550, was one of the most influential books on minerals in this period. Rubens was certainly familiar with the author, at least by 1628, as he was in that year procuring for Peresh another of his works. Moreover, as a Fleming, it would have been surprising had he not known the work of Bruges-born Boetius de Boot, and especially his Gemarum et Lapidum Historia of 1609. Rubens' contemporaries were fascinated by agate. And though color or the seemingly miraculous images that could be discerned in its milky depths once this stone were open, was opened were of great interest, it was the eye of agate that attracted attention, not least for its prophylactic potential. Ermengo's Breviari d'Amour, a 13th century manuscript, depicts one such. And there are examples also in the paper museum. Once cut from its matrix, the core of a slice of agate with its rings surrounding a dark center connected it both to the natural and the spiritual eye. Agate could thus provide an analogy. 
It was regarded as particularly effective in the treatment of the disfiguring Aleppo boil and was sometimes called Aleppo stone. Among those with an interest were Faber and Cardinal Federico Borromeo, also known to Rubens. An exchange between Faber and Borromeo exemplifies this fascination with agate eyes. Here I am preparing to send your most illustrious lordship an image of an agate stone which these recent days I have had in my hands in which an eye was sculpted most naturalistically with the tunic adnata, cornea, iris and pupil as your most illustrious lordship can see for truly no painter has equaled the artistry of nature who had expressed this figure of the eye with much more vivid colors. In thanking him, Borromeo remarks on l'occhio si naturale che veramente è cosa meravigliosa. These agates conformed to the Aristotelian law of analogies, and while such mineral specimens found their way into the drawers of Kunstkammern, they were, they were by no means without utility or merely part of what Lorraine Daston calls the economy of astonishment. We do not have Faber's Ritrato of the agate eye, but we have from Aldo Randi's collection lists of large quantities of agate eyes. And when McCarthy wanted to illustrate some, he took them from Aldo Randi's collection. Although this was not published until 1648, it represents a summary of mineralogical knowledge at the turn of the 16th century. Altravandi described these agates in lists in ophthalmological terminology. So, Acates oculum redens, Acates oculum exprimens iride albicante. In summary, by the time Rubens came to think about multiple eyes in the context of Juno and Argus, he is likely to have been well aware of the established connection between agate and the organ of sight. Agate eyes are part of a terrain melding imagery, learned debate, and actual objects that could, like the cameos made from this material, be held and examined. This is tactile knowledge. The debate could encompass nature and the human body in metamorphic state, something that morphs into something else while retaining its essence. Agate eyes formed in metamorphic stone, therefore staged in contrast to the Medusan experience, the issue of non-violent petrifaction something that fascinated those engaged in the nascent science of geology as they struggled to understand how something that originated as liquid turned into rock. Juno and Argus has been so extensively discussed one might reasonably ask what more is there to be said. I do not take issue with the authoritative findings of scholars who have focused recently on this painting, most notably Wiener, Georgievska, Schein, and Juntenen. Their work has concentrated on the commission and early ownership of the painting, on iconographical analysis, founded on a connection between theories of optics and color, especially as uh, manifest in the treatise of Aguilonius, and on the notion of an allegory of painting based on Van Manda. Nobody disputes that Juno and Argus was painted very soon after the artist's return from Italy. On the other hand, I want to situate Rubens as a more intuitive and less program-driven artist. Borrowing from William Wordsworth's formulation of poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility, I would like to draw up the notion of color recollected in tranquility, registering the move from brilliant marble intaglios to the gray skies of Flanders. The predominance of yellow, red, and blue in Rubens' work of this period has been widely discussed and attributed to the artist's interest in color theory, notably that of Aristotle and Aguilonius. 
The yellow gold so prevalent in this painting also inflects the dominant yellows of the marble cladding of the Chesi Chapel as well as St. Gregory's robe. The elaborate yellow patterning both of Juno's regal cloak and the peacock's tails recall the intaglio designs in precious stones that are the glory of the resting place of San Filippo Neri. Indeed, the very act of setting eyes into the peacock's tail is that of a jeweler or Pietre Dure craftsman transforming eyes into the gemis stellantibus described by Ovid, while the perceptual mixture of colors resonates with the mixing of color so characteristic of marble. Eye color is determined by the iris named after the goddess of the rainbow who assists Juno. And as we have seen, collectors of minerals had no hesitation in describing the colors of agate core using this term. The eyes they have removed from the head of Argus do not resemble the apple-shaped globes of Aguilonius or the female breast, as proposed by Vinner, nor do they resemble the artificial eyes that were available in this period. They are flat discs, much more like the agate eyes in the Italian museum collections discussed earlier. Rubens did not forget agate eyes. In the foreground of Peace and War, 1629 to 30, is a small child wearing an amulet or an agate eye on a cord, actually very like examples in the paper museum. Georgievska Shine sees the transition of the eyes from Argus to the bird's tails as a rebirth violence offset by tenderness. However, once we recognize the visual connection to agate eyes, we understand how the transference to the peacock's tails from the corpse of Argus turns eyes into dead stones, which, just as jewels do, glitter or shine, but are nonetheless, as de Boot puts it, material deprived of life. Dropped Subject to gravity, they fall back to earth where they originated. Even Juno is not in control here, and you can't see it, but as you know the painting well, all the eyes are all falling to the floor. Some of them they can't hold. The, through this, Rubens conjures simultaneously that fermenting world that mysteriously lies beneath the earth, the world of metalli and the organic world, as well as the celestial sphere. Many depictions of Panoptes, as Rubens must have, show, have known, showed him with the hundred eyes spread over his entire body. Rubens chose to show them confined to the head because this allowed him to position the headless corpse at the precise entry point for a viewer of the painting. It also allowed him to depict the cradling of the head at the heart of the composition with all those visual associations others have remarked on. Death is a form of petrifaction the distinctive way in which Rubens approaches the myth points up the contrast between the visit busy, albeit clumsy, hands manipulating the head, the scalpel, and the eyes on the one hand, and on the other, the useless hand that at the foot of the painting projects into the viewer's space. Rubens, as we know from a drawing made in Italy, had studied the construction of the hand. While the painting has been discussed as a dialectic between touch and vision, it is, I suggest, grounded more in specific historical tactile knowledge. Touch rather than sight is the essential sign of life. Aristotle gives a singular position to touch. It is the only sense the living cannot dispense with. Moreover, stones and hands are connected to creation in Ovid's account of Deucalion, as in so many subsequent expositions. Touch and sight are two distinct ways of knowing a stone. As Lucretius states in the passage quoted earlier, 
And touch is the interface between what is us and what is not us, the two merging at the moment of contact. While Rubens could learn by looking at Veronese or Titian, only by touching could he acquire knowledge of gems and precious stones. Touch encompasses an extraordinary range of movement and sensation. Tactile memory derives from tactile knowledge as Rubens knew when he remembered after the passage of more than 20 years holding the Gonzaga cameo in his hands. Rubens was not only an intellectually ambitious artist, he was also profoundly responsive in a haptic sense. Note how, in correspondence with Peresh in 1634 about his supposedly ancient Porringer, Rubens touchingly described it as so light and easy to hold that my wife was able to use it during her confinements without doing it any harm. Hardness and durability are much on Rubens' mind in 1610. He's just completed a vast work on slate. Materials are not merely supports for oil paintings. They are also thematic and leech into analogies like that which enables us to acknowledge the unique qualities of painting fle painted flesh within which veins are visible below the surface in terms of the chalcedonies of which the artist was so enamored, marrying an interest in the characteristics of blood as it flowed from the body that is demonstrated in the 1612 entombment with the knowledge of what color and pattern lie beneath the gray granular surface of a stone. In Juno and Argus, Rubens told a story, but in so doing, he also demonstrated how precious minerals might exemplify the complex relationship between what is living and what is dead, as understood through the senses of touch and sight upon which artistic endeavor depends. Thank you.